If you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. I'm going to call this uh, city council meeting to order at um, 7.34 p.m. The clerk wanted me to make uh, mention of the fact that we do have hearing devices for those who are in need. They're on the back table uh, adjacent to the sign-in sheet. So if you'd like to use one, please help yourself. Um, members present this evening are myself, Mayor Marl, Council Members Gearbaugh, Saibo Koenig, Rhodes, Roth, and Mayor Pro Tem Tahar. Absent is City Council Member Burgoyne. From city staff, we have City Manager Campbell, Clerk Royal, City Treasurer Bennett, Police Chief Rennick, DPW Director Fordyce. Um, I don't believe City Superintendent Engineer Rubel is here tonight, and our Technology Support Coordinator, Mr. Schonk, is also here. I would seek a motion to approve the agenda as amended. I know of one amendment, and you have in front of you a revised agenda for tonight's meeting. Um, item 14-179 on new business has been removed. It will most likely come back at our next council meeting. The applicant and staff are not quite prepared to present uh, on that particular item. Um, so unless there are additional amendments to the agenda this evening, I would seek a motion to approve it as amended. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh. Second. second? Seconded by Council Member Roth. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Uh, at this time, I would seek a motion to excuse the absence of Council Member Burgoyne. So moved. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And seconded by Councilwoman Seibel Koenig. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on now to citizen comments on agenda items. Uh, under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question on an item that appears on this agenda. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested, but not required, to state his or her name and address for the record. Are there any citizen comments on agenda items? No, then we'll proceed with the consent agenda. The consent agenda will normally be uh, adopted without discussion. However, at the request of any citizen or council member, any item may be removed from the consent agenda for council discussion. Move to approve as submitted. Thank you, Council Member Second. Rhodes, and seconded by Council Member Gearbaugh. Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda as submitted signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on to public hearings. We have two this evening, the first of which is 14-175. This is proposed ordinance number 756, additional regulations to home-based businesses. The first motion will be a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Seibel Koenig. So that was moved by Gearboss, seconded by Seibel Koenig. Um, all those in favor of opening the public hearing signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Public hearing is now opened at 7.36 p.m. Anyone who would like to speak is um, requested to come to the podium with a limit of three minutes per person. Is there anyone who would wish to, wishes to speak? Move, Move to, to close. close. Second. Move to close by Saibo Koenig and seconded by Mr. Gearbaugh. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. And the public hearing is closed at 7.37 p.m. This will be a motion to adopt or not to adopt the proposed ordinance number 756, an ordinance to amend section 5.08 of the Saline Zoning Ordinance to provide additional regulations for home-based businesses as submitted. Move to adopt. Thank you, Councilmember Rhodes. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilmember Roth. Does anyone from staff care to comment? Mr. Campbell? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this, the, the, uh, Genesis for this uh, proposed change uh, centers around the um, uh, medical marijuana law and the uh, the court uh, court changes last year. Um, initially, you may recall the, the city had adopted um, um, the Livonia model, as, as as it's called, essentially saying anything that's that is um, uh, against federal or state law as far as the use is not allowed, regardless. Um, and then that was in the, in the infancy of the medical marijuana uh, law, and now with some court action, court decisions, it's made a little more, with a little more clarification. So um, now you can no longer just uh, not allow it, even 
whether even though it's against federal law, um, but you can regulate it. And so this is the the recommendation. Um, and council uh, a number of months ago had put a moratorium on uh, to to do just this very thing to work on this uh, on an ordinance to address that. And uh, having done so, this has gone through both the um, code review task force as well as the planning commission. And this is essentially amending the um, home-based business tier one ordinance. Um, and so I'm happy to go into greater detail if, if um, council so desires or, or not. Okay. There any questions for Mr. Campbell? Let's open it up for questions first. Mr. Gearbaugh? Um, if you would just clarify what type of individual this would cover in terms of like a, it's just a primary caregiver. I think a little bit of brief of that, not that it's a full-blown any kind of business type. Sure. Well, well, it is. I mean, it is, you know, the home-based business. So um, now that's new is the uh, tier one shall be registered with the building inspector, you know, using a form that will be developed by the city. And that's regardless of that's any home-based tier one business. Um, um, you know, no more than two customers, clients, uh, students, or patients shall be permitted on the premises at any given time. Uh, no signs advertising the home-based business. Um, and this is similar to what was there before. Um, but but specific to the, the medical marijuana, uh, if you're a caregiver, a registered caregiver, um, you, can, you can provide uh, uh, plants, if you will, provide a service, right? Because you can't sell the marijuana, but you can sell the service. Uh, and so um, you can grow and sell the service of the marijuana for yourself, up to 12 plants for yourself, and up to 12 plants per patient, again, with a, with a um, medical marijuana card from the state um, that says you qualify, and up to, so up to five patients. And so then there's requirements as far as how it, you know, it's got to be in a locked um, container structure, um, those types of things. And then this, this just helps us um, because in, in these grow operations, you could have excessive el electricity use, mm -hmm. uh, plumbing, water, those types of things. And so we want to make sure that um, that these uh, places that, that are doing this, they're not, you know, 110 um, inadequate uh, extension cords running and that type of thing. So we want to make sure it's safe for the dweller, the people that are dwelling in that, that uh, home as well as the neighbors. Um, as, as best as possible. However, caveat, I mean, state law requires, I mean, this information is confidential. We cannot release it, um, and that's per law. Um, so, but again, this is a way of, of making sure that those, those places are, are uh, um, responsibly um, Regulated. Wired and regulated, just so so uh, for safety reasons. It's just primary. I just want to clarify that this is for primary caregivers and individuals that have been authorized by the state. Yes. Nobody else. Thank yes, you. but it, but because it is a because it is in, you know, a lot. Of, you're exactly right, Mr. Gearback, That that um, a lot of these changes are specific to the medical marijuana, but there are some that are general to the tier one. Right. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any follow up, Mr. Gearback? No. Okay. Any additional questions for Mr. Campbell or any other member of city staff? No? Any comments? No? Okay. Well, that's been properly moved by Council Member Rhodes, seconded by Roth, to adopt. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on now to public hearing item 14 176. This is proposed ordinance number 757, revision to the historic district ordinance. Why don't we do this one in reverse? Mr. Fordyce, do you want to come up and talk a little bit about this before we open uh, the public hearing? And then, of course, if council members have any questions, we'll, we'll entertain those at this time. Thank you. Uh, the current ordinance that uh, HCC operates <coughs> under was adopted in August of 1998. And at that time, um, that was just prior to formation of our first district or kind of they were, sort of happened basically at the same time. And there was concern amongst the residents of that first proposed district that the HDC would be too aggressive, too, um, I could say, nitpicky. And there were some ex examples in, in nearby commissions where there had been uh, some, some conflict. So there were modifications made to our ordinance, which is based on uh, the state enabling legislature and most um, many HDCs follow that model 
Um, there was one sentence put in there that would limit design review of this HDC to extra year changes that require a building permit. So we had the building code. We decided to restrict ourselves to things that required a permit under that code, and this ordinance was adopted. Um, a couple years after the Historic District Commission ordinance was adopted, the building code changed. So things that required review because they required a building permit no longer required review because they no longer required a building permit. Um, and a couple of those items are uh, fences, sheds, uh, window awnings, and driveways. Those were items that, that fell out of the building code. Um, and also what has happened is the um, contractors and manufacturers have developed some new techniques and there are some significant changes that can be made to a building that because of the way they're done no longer uh, that do not require a building permit under the current building code. Um, example of that would be sash replacements on windows. You can replace the glass and the frame around that glass uh, and that does not require a building permit any longer. Um, but that can have a significant effect on a, on a historic structure. And also there's uh, some discussion about whether or not um, siding uh, might require a building permit or not in the future. I think there's been a little bit of case law on that. I'm not sure exactly where that's going. Um, and maybe even roofing. So to address the items that have fallen out because of building code changes and to kind of prepare ourselves for things that may change in the building code in the future, uh, that was one of the reasons for this. Um, and we've had, the commission has had some uh, specific examples um, where we feel there's been a loss of historical integrity on some structures because a change has been made, <coughs> excuse me, that did not require a building permit um, and therefore was not reviewable. So this um, was brought to the attention of our uh, city attorneys and they looked over the ordinance and noted that there's essentially there's a conflict within the existing ordinance in um, section 2-220 it very prominently says uh, a permit shall be attained before any work affecting the exterior appearance of a resource is performed and then later on in the ordinance in 2-228 kind of tucked in at the very end of a of a lengthy paragraph is a sentence that says design review will be reserved for applications requiring a building permit so We've got one section that says any work and another one that says uh, only when a building permit's required. So there's a little bit of an internal conflict within the ordinance. Um, but the way it's been um, administered is that, that that second sentence they're reserving for applications requiring a building permit, that's, that's how the commission is operated. Um, so as I mentioned, this has become uh, an issue within the districts, uh, making it difficult for HDC to uh, perform its, the role that it's been uh, placed there to do, which is to protect the, uh, the identified historic resources uh, within Saline. So uh, we had a meeting. Members, there were some members of council, the HDC staff, and our city attorney via uh, telephone met on July 14th to discuss the issue and the challenges that HDC was facing and um, come up with some possible solutions. Uh, then HDC held a work meeting on July 29 to discuss the ordinance um, and came up with uh, some proposed changes to the ordinance and a list of uh, exterior changes that they would uh, like to have review authority. Those were forwarded to the attorneys again to draft up an ordinance. Um, they made some organizational changes in uh, the two sections, 2-220 and 2-228. Um, and then also suggested two more areas of review that uh, the commission might want to consider. The commission looked at those uh, at their August 26th meeting and uh, rejected one of the items that the uh, attorneys had recommended and uh, accepted the other one. And uh, the ordinance was redrafted, and, or the, the draft re-ordinance was re redrafted, and that's uh, what's uh, before you tonight. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Fordyce. Are there any questions for Mr. Fordyce? Mr. Rhodes and then Mr. Gearbaugh. Um, it's generally understood that um, this ordinance applies to 
historic structures contained within a historic district. But in reading through this, I don't see where it specifically states that. It, it actually it applies to any building within a historic district. There are a few, um, because of the way the boundaries get drawn and the rules of the state when we're forming a, a district, there are sometimes non-historic structures within a historic district. And um, those are subject to a less stringent review, but they, they still need to be reviewed so that they don't end up having a negative impact on the district overall. So anything within a local historic district is, is up for review. Yeah, and does it actually say that in here somewhere? I, I think we, we all kind of understand that, but I'm not sure that somebody brand new to the community looking at this thing would know that whether they were in a historic structure or not, if they're in a district, they have to go through this process. And conversely, if they're not in a district, they can ignore this process. I'm sorry I did not bring that up earlier, but it just, it just kind of struck me this evening. <laughs> Mr. Mayor? Please. Um, I actually had the same question uh, that Mr. Rhodes had. I went, went back and looked at the, the code, and this part is in a larger section that's devoted to historic district. district. So right. I was willing, but maybe we shouldn't, I was willing to make the assumption that the fact that it's located in the larger section on the historic district would be sufficient to. But yeah, these are just two sections within the entire ordinance. Um, so I, I'm kind of trying to scan through the rest of the ordinance to see if I see where that's spelled out. I, well, in, just quickly, in, in 2-218, it says the city may, by ordinance, establish one or more historic districts. The district shall be administered by a commission established. Um, I think one of the issues with the historic districts and everything is similar to like zoning. We're not always clear where zoning is because unless we look at some document or someone asks about it, we aren't clear. We've tried to identify, I think, with some signage as to where historic districts are, but it doesn't clearly identify it. And that's why we've been trying either through the web pages and some other things to identify it specifically. How you would identify it within the ordinance itself, I don't think they ever wanted to expand it beyond just verbiage because it would then allow additional um, districts to be added without having to go back in and amend the ordinance every time a district was added, I thought. Yeah, yeah each, or, each district has been formed by the adoption of a, an right. individual ordinance declaring that district. Um, and we do have maps up on the website. Um, and that's, you know, the educational efforts of getting people to know, yeah, you, you know, you've been living in a district for the past 10 years and, yeah. and there's special rules here. Surprise. And that's kind of what we've been trying to do is annually we're going to be notifying every homeowner within the districts to notify them, at least to understand that they're part of it and what other information is there. So we do understand people turn over and have that kind of issue. If you wanted to look at it, Mr. Rhodes. Well, if it's contained elsewhere. Yeah, I'd larger just, context. Yeah. 2-217. 217. While he looks at that, Mr. Gearbaugh, did you have a question or a comment, sir? Um, yeah, I was just going to ask Mr. Fordyce, um, one of the clarifications that we do know that we're looking at this is because when you look at what the um, Secretary of Interior standards and the state's requirements are, if we're not in compliance with them, we could jeopardize our current designation as... Uh, Certified local government. Yeah, that's right. correct. Um, I think if we were put under a, a bright spotlight and, and uh, analyzed against the... Uh, the Secretary of the Interior Standards and the, the uh, State Historic Preservation Office, there, there'd be some, some questions um, about our ability to, to uh, truly enforce historic preservation. Which would cost us potentially in any future revenues or grants or anything that we could have. And also the designation that we have is quite unique because there's not a lot of cities that have this designation. And I'm, I don't remember the last count, but I think it's less than 20 within yeah. the state. So what are we doing? And it's not to prohibit individuals from it, but it's mostly to enhance all of these items that we've basically been able to benefit from in the past. Any other questions for Mr. Fordyce regarding uh, the memorandum or his presentation? No. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. 
At this time, I would seek a motion to open the public hearing at uh, 7.53 p.m. I so move. Moved by Council Member Roth. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Gearbaugh. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. The public hearing is now open. Anyone who would like to speak is requested to come to the podium, and there's a limit of three minutes per person. Hello, I'm Suzanne DeVries. I'm a member of the Historic District Commission. I'd like to reiterate what Jeff uh, mentioned earlier in regards to meeting the standards of the Secretary of Interior standards. Uh, based on the map of what's identified in the Historic District Commission, you see they are clearly defined in what is deemed appropriate for review for the Historic District Commission. I want to reiterate that we do take into con consideration contributing versus non-contributing um, buildings within those districts um, to assure Council Member David Rhodes of that um, for his benefit. Uh, I do would like to also stress that we um, would like to keep this open and um, adjustable for the future as far as making sure ordinance stand the test of time and that we are able to do our job for the city in the matter that is most benefit to the city as a whole. I thank you for your time and consideration of this ordinance and welcome any future uh, questions or considerations for the Historic District Commission at our monthly meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Is there anyone else who, who wishes to speak? Then I would seek a motion to close the public hearing at uh, 7.54 p.m. So moved. Moved by Council Member Gearbaugh. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Roth. All those in favor of closing the public hearing signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. Public hearing is now closed. The last motion is a motion to adopt or not to adopt ordinance number 757, an ordinance amending sections 2-220 and 2-228 of the city code and to authorize the historic district commission to review certain proposed work. Move, Move to adopt. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Tahar and Mr. Rhodes. Are you comfortable Support. being a second? Excellent. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any discussion? Mr. Gearbaugh. I'd just like to appreciate the council's attention to this matter because it has been a, um, a concern of a commission and our commission members are really dedicated into looking at how this will benefit. It's not an idea of trying to take over control, but there's been a lot of confusion and I think um, frustration even from the homeowners part. And I think there are a lot of individuals that have been dedicated to restoring their homes and keeping them going. And in fact, we just recently had some homeowners come forward with a new roofing material. We've allowed for that type of thing. There's homes that have had their windows replaced because there was different. It's just a concern of, in certain cases, we've had windows that have been in a historic building for 120 years and now are gone. So it's those kind of things where once things are gone, they're gone for good. There are reasons things can't be repaired, but the guidelines and I think just a consistent review by the city will help us preserve these assets for decades to come. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh. Mayor Pro Tem Tahar. Um, yes, I'd just like to add, I, I understand that some of the, the conflict within the ordinance caused some difficulties for staff as well. Right. And so I think that this will have a beneficial effect for staff working with the ordinance as well. Thank Additional you. comments? Well, let me just add um, to, to Mr. Gearbaugh's point. Uh, the members of our HDC are extremely dedicated, and I want to thank Bob and Suzanne for being here this evening. I also had the opportunity, I believe, last week or the week prior to talk to um, the chair of, of HDC, Lori Swick, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, but is also very supportive of uh, the proposed changes, and I think contributed somewhat to Mr. Fordyce's presentation. Um, I also should note that I appreciate um, Council's um, flexibility and the flexibility of our code and ordinance review task force because as you may recall these types of changes um, are supposed to be reviewed by that body prior to coming before City Council um, but I've never really believed in having hard and fast rules and I think because of the nature of some of the incidents that Mr. Gearbaugh has articulated and Mr. Fordyce, it was important to fast track this. Um, so I think as Mr. Fordyce alluded to, we had an initial meeting with our city attorney um, and members of the HDC and city staff in July, and then this progressed rather quickly, and I'm very pleased with that. Um, and I think this will avoid um, or help us avoid a lot of confusion and um, um, 
well, problematic incidents uh, in the future, um, and it will be beneficial to both um, the HDC and to city staff. So again, thank you for our, uh, to our commissioners for um, tackling this issue or helping us tackle this, and thanks to to, uh, to staff and our legal counsel. And uh, I, I enthusiastically uh, endorse this this motion. Is there anything else? No, that's been properly moved by Mayor Pro Tem Tahar and seconded by Rhodes to adopt. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on now to old business, item 14-83. This is Will Fleener, Eagle Scout Project Change. This will be a motion to acknowledge the memo dated August the 19th, 2014, from Parks Commission Recording Secretary Roberts, and to approve or not to approve the scope change in Will Fleener's Eagle Scout Project of building an agility course at the Mill Pond Dog Park to build hurdles instead of a tunnel due to the high cost of materials for the tunnel. Is there a motion? I move to approve. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilwoman Saibo Koenig. Will, we appreciate you being here this evening. You want to talk a little bit about uh, your proposed change? Yes, please. I guess you have a PowerPoint as well. I do. Okay. Yes. And um, hopefully you guys do have a, a presentation in your little packet. We yes, do, I or do. at least I, I do. Does everyone have a, a yep. hard yep. copy of that? Excellent. Will, why don't we wait until the screen lowers and your PowerPoint pops up, but as soon as that occurs, you're welcome to begin. All right. Okay, so um, probably been more than a few months now. I came before you guys to get my Eagle Scout project uh, approved. And um, so far I went through and everything went very smoothly except for the fact that the dog tunnel far exceeded my budget that I had proposed as well as the money I raised for that. And so in place of that, I would like to suggest a change from that to tunnels. So first off, I'm just gonna go over you know, the pros and cons of each and go, go from there. So, my proposed change would be to place these there, which in place of the dog tunnel, I put these up because I don't want to leave some posts there because I can get in the way. So these dog hurdles are currently there. Um, so of course, these are two feet in width. Um, they're made with PVC pipe, about 18 inches high, but of course, that can be adjusted rather easily, just a drill. Um, the post, like the rest of the project, is cemented into the ground below the frost line and it's all treated lumber so it won't rot or anything like that. Um, and the PVC pipe is very durable, flexible enough so that it won't hurt the dogs, however it is sturdy enough where it won't come falling apart. Um, what would be, it, would, it would be replacing would be the dog tunnel, um, which would typically be 24 inches in diameter and 12 to 20 feet in length. Um, this would cost upwards of over 300 to $400 at least, not including transportation costs. Um, I only raised about $240 in the ball drive, which covered everything else perfectly. Um, and like I said, it would cost about $350 from the cheapest place I could find it would be in Menards, um, not including transport cost. So at no additional cost, I mean, the fact it's up there right now, the dog hurdles would be a, I think, a viable and suggested second option. As well as in retrospect, uh, me and the Parks Commission both agree that in terms of a permanent and long-standing structure, it would be uh, better and an improvement, frankly, because less chance for vandalism. It's not. It's it's open to the air now instead of enclosed space that could harbor anything else in there that could happen. Go happen to ha go on there. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Very good. Are there any questions for the applicant, Mr. Rhodes? Um, you said, I believe, that the um, hurdle height could be adjusted? Yes. And how, do, how is that done? Um, if you look at it on the picture there, on the two, so there's the PVC pipe, but then on the outside edges of the PVC pipe are two pieces of wood and then the actual posts. Um, those pieces of wood are just currently, they're screwed into the, um, the posts, and so all you have to do is unscrew both sides, and then you can move the post up and, or the uh, PVC pipe up and down, and then re-screw it back in. So it's not set up for a dog owner who has a bigger dog or a more athletic no. dog to, to change it for that animal? No, no, not the pump. It is set That's at right. a relatively like average height, so most dogs will be able to use it. However, mm -hmm. you know, if you guys want to change it in the future or anything like that, it would just be, I mean, you could do it with a screwdriver, basically. Just four screws in each one. Okay. Any follow-ups, Mr. Rhodes? No. No? Okay. Any additional questions from City Council? No? Will, thank you very much. Appreciate your work. Thank you.
they disappear anyway. <laughs> Is there any additional discussion on this motion? No? Okay. Well, this has been properly moved by Roth, seconded by Councilwoman Saibo Koenig to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. <coughs> Thank you again. Appreciate your time this evening. We move on now to new business item 14-177. This is Rec Center Ventilation Project. This will be a motion to acknowledge receipt of the September 4th, 2014 memo from City Manager Campbell and to authorize an award or not authorize the Rec Center Natrium Ventilation Project to process results in the amount not to exceed $14,000. Is there a motion? Move to authorize an award. Thank you, Mr. Gearba. Is there a second? Support. Supported by Council Member Rhodes. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Campbell to uh, discuss his memo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you all may recall that uh, back on August 18th, we had a work session at City Council uh, where we invited um, process results. Uh, Dale Niehammer, who's here as well, for, for any questions. Uh, if uh, Council has some specific uh, questions to what we're proposing, but we, we at the August 18th work, se work session, we talked about the ongoing uh, long-time ventilation issues at the rec center, essentially since it was constructed and there's been, over the years, been some, some attempts to uh, resolve those problems, but um, the bottom line is we, we, still, we still have some problems. And, and also, when we, when we did the remodel in 07, um, we, uh, you may recall, we, um, when we constructed the um, family locker room, um, that essentially where the, the, uh, the sauna or the hot tub is located, that kind of put that it's off in its own little island, if you will. And so the airflow over there is, is virtually nil. And so uh, process results has given us a proposal. Um, we began working with them uh, last winter. You may recall it was uh, budgeted for in the rec center's uh, budget for the current year, and that was from the, the work that they have, uh, they've done thus far. So they're proposing to um, uh, help us uh, uh, to, to redesign, uh, to, to redesign and, and, and design a, a fix to make it, uh, uh, imp to make the air quality as, it's, as it should be uh, in the natatorium uh, or the pool and area. Um, then they would also help staff um, draft um, requests for proposal RFP language and um, then uh, Again, they would help us evaluate those, and then they would um, provide uh, oversight uh, for uh, the installation and, and the, uh, the actual work that's being done. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Are there any questions? No, we sort of went over this pretty thoroughly a couple weeks ago when we had our work meeting. Okay. Um, any discussion? Mr. Roth. I just want to get a clarification. This $14,000 is just for the study and proposal and not the implementation of the ventilation system? The, the $14,000 would be for them to do the design, to design the, the fix, if you will, and then to help us um, draft, assist staff in, the, uh, in drafting the, the uh, RFP language uh, and evaluating those proposals as they come in, and then um, also providing the, um, the oversight for the contractors as they're doing their work to make sure that they do the right things. And then in addition to that um, would be the actual work by the contractor. That is, that's outside of the 14,000. You may recall the initial proposal said a range uh, between 75 to $100,000 to, to um, make the necessary repairs or re redesign. Is there any insurance or assurance that this is the fix? And if it isn't the fix that we can come back and have some recourse so we don't get sold a, a false bill of materials or whatever it may be? I would ask Dale, that's more of a technical question that... Uh... Yeah, I'm sorry, Dale, please, if you'd like to make any comment about this, we would welcome, we'd welcome that. Yeah, the, um, the problem with the facility right now is that you have no way to balance the airflow. What we're gonna do is we're going to design a system that you can actually balance so you get air down to the other end. To commit at this point, not being in the details of it, I, I really can't sit here and say, 
100% that we're going to make it um, with this 14,000. This 14,000 dollars is to design the system, but at that point, once we've designed it, then we'll be able to t tell you absolutely we can guarantee it. But at this point, I can't until I get into the details exactly what that total about 100. Thousand dollars, seventy-five thousand dollar budget is going to be. I don't know that until we get into it. That's a, a, a order of magnitude definition grade estimate. It's a risk you're not willing to take. I I feel very comfortable with that. I honestly do. Um, your system seems to be operating properly at the unit. The problem is in the distribution system. Any additional questions? Okay. Appreciate you. you being here this evening. Appreciate yep. your work on this. Yep. Um, well, if there's nothing further, it's been properly moved by Councilmember Gearbaugh, seconded by Councilmember Rhodes to authorize and to award. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. We move on to new business item 14 178. This is Mausoleum Centennial Celebration. This will be a motion to authorize or not to authorize the Saline Historic Society to set up a tent and chairs in front of the mausoleum and to distribute literature for the 100th celebration of the mausoleum. Move to authorize. You want a second, Mr. Roth? No, no. I just want to be remove myself from this okay. out of business, but conflict of interest. Okay. Um, so Mr. Roth will be abstaining. Um, and it's been moved by Mr. Rhodes, I'm sorry, is that correct, sir? It is. All right, to authorize? Second. Okay. Yeah. And Mayor Pro Tem Tahar is the second. Yes. Mr. Alfred, would you like to come up and comment, yes. sir? Yes, I would, I would just want to clarify a couple things that uh, uh, the tent will be in the inside or outside of the mausoleum, but we're proposing to put the chairs within the mausoleum and the use of some power for a PA system. And what we are doing, this is the first of a series of educational series of, from the Historic Society. And uh, it's going to be a, a, a story about the people within the mausoleum and within the cemetery. And so we are proposing that we will have seats within and not outside of the mausoleum. And that they will be put up and removed on the same day. And we strongly invite all of you at, uh, and the council and the people who are in attendance to uh, come because much of the histories of cities and villages are found within the confines of cemeteries, the people of the mayors, the past people, and the founders of the cemetery. So what it is is there are going to be chairs within it, and, uh, and they will be put up and removed on that same day. Very good. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions? No? Doug, we appreciate you being here tonight. Appreciate your leadership. Uh, with the Historic Society as well. Um, any discussion? Sounds like a nice event, and I'm sure you'll see quite, quite, uh, quite a few of us there. So thank you for your work on this. If there's nothing further, it's been properly moved by Councilmember Rhodes, seconded by Tahar to authorize. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. And Mr. Roth, you're going to abstain, sir, is that correct? Correct. Right. Okay, and one abstention. So the motion passes. We'll move on now to new business item 14-180. This is forestry grant. This will be a motion to acknowledge the August 19th, 2014 memo from Parks Commission Recording Secretary Roberts and to approve or not to approve the request for staff to apply for a community forestry grant. So moved. To approve, to Mr. Approve. Yes. Thank you, sir. Is there a second? Support. Second. Support by Council Member Rhodes. Uh, Mr. Fortis, do you care to comment at all, sir? Thank you. Um, this grant uh, has a couple of different categories uh, of available funding, and the one that uh, makes most sense for us is funding the planting of trees. Uh, we did apply for this grant back in 2009 and uh, didn't get it at that time. Uh, so basically planning on just rehashing that application. Um, those most, I think all of those locations that were identified in that one, which are street trees scattered throughout the city basically, um, have not been planted yet. Um, so the maximum amount available in, the, in tree planting is $4,000, and um, there's a sub-maximum that will only fund $125 per tree, so that comes out to 32 trees. Um, and then we have to pay the planting costs, one year of maintenance, and um, the additional cost of the trees. Uh, so the estimated um, 
matching funds that we'll need is uh, $10,200. Uh, about 3,800 of that is in-kind equipment and labor. Um, so we're looking at $6,400 of uh, uh, cash match, which has been budgeted within the um, <clears throat> our Metro Fund uh, account. So, very good. Thank you, Mr. Ford. So, there any questions for him regarding his um, memorandum or the memorandum? Excuse me, from the Parks Commission. Curious. Here, Bob. Yes. Do you recall why we didn't get it in 2009? Because we got it in 2008, so okay. we got moved to a lower <laughs> priority tier. Thanks, Mr. Rhodes. Would the uh, proposed trees be planted primarily in the residential areas of our town? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Any additional questions? No. Mr. Fordyce, thank you. Appreciate it. Any additional discussion? Seems like a no-brainer to me. Um, we'll proceed to vote then. It's been properly moved by Council Member Gearbaugh, seconded by Rhodes, to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Move on to new business item 14-181. This is utility bill waiver for late fees. This will be a motion to acknowledge the September 4th, 2014 memo from City Manager Campbell and to approve or not to approve the waiving of late fees due to extraordinary circumstances of utility bills not being delivered. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Councilmember Rhodes, excuse me. Councilmember Rhodes moves to approve. Is there a second? Roth will second it. Roth will second it. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Campbell or Ms. Bennett, do you care to speak on, uh, on this topic? Good evening. As you may recall in a communique that we recently sent, shortly after the water bills were due this year, we sent out past due notices and we started getting um, an absorbent amount of people calling stating that they never received the bill. This was the first that they had heard of the bill. And when we were writing these messages down, um, we noticed that they were all in the same neighborhood. We've had a num two condo associations that have came in shortly thereafter and said, which is in the same neighborhood or the same area, and stated that none of their residents other than the ones that have electronic payments received or had an email had received their actual mailing of the bill. Um, I, my water billing clerk, Gala Duke, did go down to talk to the postmaster and they, you know, addressed us to the 1-800 number and we have filed a claim. They, um, both at the 1-800 number for the United States Postal Service and the local postmaster does agree that it does appear that there was, I mean, it's, it's too many. And one day alone, we had 26 people in one walking route. And by the routes that I'm referring to, it's the route that our DPW people walk. Now, if it's the same as the mailing route, I'm not sure, but they're in a neighborhood that our DPW walks when they read the reads. So everyone, including the post office, agrees that there um, appears to be a problem with the delivery system, and we are currently researching the bills go from, well, we verified in-house first that the number of bills printed and the number of bills that we um, sent for stuffing and distribution matched within reason to our last quarterly bills. And our amount of postage that we paid and was billed for from the post office was also within reason um, so that led us to believe that the somewhere once they got to Celine Post Office, when they get to the Celine Post Office, they are delivered off-site to a um, um, I can't remember the official name they used a sorting facility, and that sorting facility right now is the local postmaster called me and said that you know they know that when they come in, they're in the organized fashion, and they went to the sorting facility, and they are investigating that at this point. I have not, this has been kind of a cumbersome going from the federal level to the local level to a sorting facility level, and, but at this point, everyone agrees that it seems ironic and that there's a problem. No one's found any missing mail. <laughs> um, I had advised the residents when they came in that the city council had approved a one-time waiver that they could, you know, request that one-time waiver and we would waive the late fees. Some have done that. Some have, um, I had 26 of them that I signed off on upon my return um, for one-time waivers. And then some have just asked that, is there something we can do under the circumstances? Um, so therefore, we're coming to the city council to ask for 
your approval under these circumstances as i mentioned in my communique there was an error whether it was a billing error i don't know i i I'm fairly certain it's not a billing error from my part but a system delivery error there any questions for our city treasurer mr rhodes and then mr roth I just wanted to verify that for these particular individuals with the apparent lost mailing that this waiver does not take over their one-time waiver. That's what that I'm asking your permission. one-time waiver is still there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank if you. I, if I could. With, Please, a, with your approval this evening. Please, yeah. Mr. Campbell, then we'll get to Mr. Roth. Yeah, just for clarification, currently there are some that have, that's right. what they've utilized. We'll, we'll have to reject, return Correct. that back. Correct. Yeah. Mr. Roth? Listen carefully to your explanation you said that the number of bills that you submitted to the people to be sent out matched the number that they were delivering to the post office. I look, feel that there could be a possibility of error that we did not print out that batch that came up missing. Oh. Did you compare the number of meters to the number of bills? Absolutely. When I say we compared the number of bills, that's the bills that were printed. So at the end of our report, it generates a list that says how many bills are actually printed. And we have reams of, you know, reams of paper. We're talking 4,000 bills. So we put reams of paper and, you know, you count out how many, you know, 500 sheets a ream, and it, it matched that all the bills were printed. The point I'm trying to make, I'm thinking there could be possibility that that batch never was printed. Therefore, the numbers that were printed will match the numbers that would be mailed. So and they a do. There's possibility that they were, were not printed for some reason. So if we had to match the number of meters to the number of bills printed, yeah, then I get, we would come up with the right number. I think we're saying the same thing. The number of meters that we bill annually, quarterly, were reviewed to the numbers of bills printed and reviewed to the number of bills that were delivered. Okay. So we're saying the same thing. I'm getting pretty good at saying the same thing and arguing with people. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions for either uh, Treasurer Bennett or Mr. Campbell? Mr. Gearball. Not a question, but I'll be abstaining. My father had a bill that was missing, so um, because of this waiver fee, I will not be voting on this. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gearball. Your abstention is duly noted. Additional uh, questions? Ms. Bennett, thank you. You're welcome. Additional comments? Well, I'll just make one comment. First of all, uh, I know that uh, the Treasurer's Department and Ms. Bennett and the utility clerk, um, Ms. LaDuke, have worked hard on this, and I, I appreciate um, your efforts. Um, my uh, position and, and policy relating to the waiving of fees for late tax bills or utility bills has been perfectly consistent since my tenure on council began in 2009. However, um, acknowledging that there are some extraordinary um, circumstances at play, um, I will support the motion that's been moved by Councilmember Rhodes and Roth um, to waive fees and still to grant those petitioners that one-time waiver. Um, I've actually spoken to a number of people who have not received their most recent utility bill, and these are people who are not habitually late. Um, they consistently pay their tax bill and their utility bills on time, um, and they say pretty emphatically that they did not receive a bill. Um, I also know from talking to, to Ms. Bennett and some of her subordinates that there's a, a normal amount of people who come in uh, when a utility bill is due or when a tax bill is due and indicate that they did not receive um, the bill and therefore should be subject to um, you know, an exemption or a waiving of fees. Um, and there's a normal amount, and that's gonna, that, that will be expected. Um, however, again, to articulate something that Ms. Bennett um, mentioned earlier, this was a extraordinary large number of people. Um, who indicated they did not receive a bill. So um, staff worked very hard to, to identify the problem. It's yet to be identified, um, but in the meantime, I think the appropriate and um, correct um, step for this council to take is to, uh, to waive fees um, for these uh, utility bills. Any additional comments? No? That's been properly moved by Rhodes, seconded by Roth to approve. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it, and the motion carries with one abstention. We move on now to our final new business item. This is 14-189. This is a series of two motions. This is CBI Telecom. The first motion will be a motion to acknowledge uh, the September 2nd, 2014 memo from Technology Support Coordinator Shonk 
and to approve or not to approve the recommendations for the Verizon wireless account, the Frontier wire line, and the T1 lines, and to authorize or not to authorize the payment in the amount of $6,582.42 to CBI Telecom. Is there a motion? I'll move to accept the memo. Okay, you want to start with that, Mr. Gearbaugh? So the first motion will be a motion to acknowledge the September 2nd, 2014 memo from Sup Technology Support Coordinator Schock. Second. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Tar. Mr. Schock, do you want to come up and comment on your memo, and then we'll open it up for questions? Okay. The uh, memo we have in front of you is uh, a breakdown of a thorough, uh, kind of long-lasting review that we worked with uh, CBI on. It started kind of late January uh, of this year, and we broke down pretty much every line the city has. If it's a you know, wireless phone, if it's a security line at any outlying building, we, we looked at everything. We looked at the usage. We looked at the best way to kind of optimize our plans uh, that we currently have and, and going forward. So um, kind of in front of you is an abridged version of that because obviously it's, it's a fairly extensive kind of breakdown of uh, all the lines at all the different buildings. But. Very good. Thank you, sir. What questions does council have for our technology support coordinator? Mr. Gearbox. Just curious, isn't this like the third time we've had a company like this review our phone This services? will be the second. Our second? Yes. Okay. How come some of this wasn't discovered the first time? Is it just... Uh, so the first one we hit kind of a high level and we, we tackled most of the things. This was much more in depth. We didn't touch wireless last time, which we, we've hit this time. The other thing that kind of threw it off last time is that we started uh, with Verizon wireless, or Verizon Landline, and then they merged with Frontier halfway through the audit, so that kind of complicated things. So now that Frontier has taken over all these accounts, they've changed a lot of their plans. That what Verizon offered, they don't. So now we're optimizing to kind of meet uh, in kind of Frontier land, if you Got will. So. Mr. Roth, or Mr. Rhodes, excuse me. <laughs> Get my R's you're, you're confused <laughs> tonight. Yeah. Um, could you speak to the, the loss of our phone lines over this last weekend? What caused sure. that? And if there's anything we can do to help prevent that occurring right. again? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's actually an extremely unfortunate timing. So the, uh, the contract we're looking to renew is what actually failed over the weekend. Um, given the storms, Frontier doesn't have an exact error on what happened, but uh, our circuit that kind of um, feeds every outlying building went down and it's one of those you know knock on wood it's, it's been solid since i've been here we've never had to go out so this is the first one the storm hit and then unfortunately we just had some trouble getting them to, to service the problem but you know once they serviced it then we were we were back up and running so um, we are having a meeting with them coming up in the following week to discuss kind of the failure and how to prevent it from from yeah, happening i was just wondering if there's an opportunity to create a, a secondary circuit that there is and that's something it's, it's just like I said, it's been, a, it's been rock solid, so we haven't considered a second circuit. It's just an additional cost. We couldn't add another circuit for redundancy. The, the only downside is there's only one player in town that is Frontier. So even if we have two circuits, we have two Frontier circuits. If they both go down, you know, we're still kind of in the same place. So it's hard to kind of justify the additional cost. So. Okay. That would be here, interesting hearing more about that as, right. as you meet with them. Mr. Gearbaugh, did you have a follow-up, sir? Yeah, just clarify what, when you just mentioned that we, Frontier is the only one, but on the other option that we had here was AT&T. Right. So. So how that works is uh, the, the T1 in question is a direct line to Bemis uh, Road for our radio tower. So for our police, they use it primarily for all their, you know, communications. So uh, it's Frontier territory up until Platte Road is my understanding, and then east of that is AT&T. So we're stuck paying for the first leg with Frontier, and then because it's exclusively an AT&T, we're stuck using AT&T for the second leg. Yeah. So okay. um, part of my recommendation here, too, is not to do a full 36-month uh, renewal with AT&T because we have a possibility of eliminating that completely. So um, since we renewed last time, Pittsfield Township has uh, elected to run their own fiber out there and not pay, so we have a potential to tap into that, which isn't set in stone, but it's something to look at. Because if we go with a 36 month and we cancel it, we're on the hook for way more than what if we, we do a 24. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you. Additional questions? Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Yeah, appreciate it. Why don't you stay put though, in case people have some okay. uh, questions, because we're gonna have two additional motions here. Um, any subsequent discussion regarding the first motion, which is simply to acknowledge receipt of the September 2nd memo? No? It's been properly moved by Gearbaugh, seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Tahar to acknowledge receipt. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries unanimously. Um, the second motion will be a motion to approve or not to approve the recommendations for the Verizon wireless account, the Frontier wireless line, and the T1 lines, and to authorize or not authorize the payment in the amount of $6,582.42 to CBI Telecom. 
Move to approve and authorize. Thank you, Council Member Rhodes. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Council Member Roth. Any discussion? Mr. Gearbaugh. Do we need to condition this at all with now what happened this past weekend? That's a discussion, <coughs> yeah. So I, that, that was great. I guess at this time I would say no, but it's going to be discussed. Yeah. I, I don't know if Mr. Campbell. Mr. Campbell wants to comment. Well, a, a thought could be because uh, City Council has back to back, so next Monday we have another meeting. Okay. So, sure. Yeah, that's so that's fine. With I believe the meeting is this week, correct? It is. Yes. So. Um, so should we postpone this? We could. We could post. You you all could postpone it. I, I think that'd make a better instead of having to redo it. So I think I'd like to go that route. And would your recommendation, Mr. Gearbaugh, be to postpone the um, subsequent subsequent motion as well? Yeah, we might okay. as well have it all at one shot. All right. Well, let me refer back then to the mover and the second. It's been moved properly moved by Rhodes, seconded by Roth, to approve and to authorize. Do you want to maintain that motion, or would you withdraw your motion and your second? I withdraw it. You withdraw in, in favor withdraw. of tabling it to the next meeting. Okay. So um, yeah, what I'd like then is a motion. You've used the right verbiage, Mr. Uh, Rhodes. Congratulations. Uh, a motion to table to our subsequent meeting, which will be on September the 15th. Would you like to move that, Mr. Rhodes? I do. Okay. So actually, can we make it both motion, the sub, the second part of motion A and B to and table? And B to table both okay. until our next meeting. Is everyone clear on that? Mm -hmm. Good. Is there a second to that? Second. Seconded by Mr. Gearbaugh. Any discussion? Okay, that's been properly moved by Rhodes, seconded by Roth to table the second part of motion A and the entirety of B to our next meeting on September the 15th. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The motion carries. This will appear as unfinished business on the 15th. Mr. Schock, thank Thanks, you very much. Thank you. We move on now to discussion. The discussion portion of our agenda, excuse me, commission, committee, and task force reports from council members. Mr. Rhodes. Um, the Environmental Commission, uh, in conjunction with the county, is sponsoring a hazardous waste collection event on September the 20th. It will be held at the DPW building, uh, same location as last year. Uh, starts at 9 o'clock, and I'm not sure of the ending time because we, in the staffing side of it, have to stay longer. Um, so come early. But uh, you can bring most, any, most anything that you can uh, get there, they will take. Uh, they do have a suggested donation of uh, $10 per vehicle. Thank you. That's it on um, commission report. Okay. Any additional commission, committee, or task force reports? Mr. Gearbaugh. Just HDC. We received a report at our last meeting about the um, Velocipede shed, and it's going up really well. Max Kelly, Eagle Scout project, and I encourage anyone to go and look at it. It's looking quite... Um, um, how do I say it? Blends in with the environment using the old barn siding and everything you thought that that building was there. Very good. Any other commission, committee, or task force reports? Mr. Rhodes. Uh, on a task force report, um, Mayor Pro Tem Terhar and I continue to participate in the code review meetings. Um, it's not the most fun thing in the world, but uh, <laughs> useful. And um, so we're making progress, and in the not too distant future, I expect that some of those ordinances will come back to council for approval. Very good. Thank you. Anything else on the commission, committee, or task force front? No, then we move on to reports and other announcements. Mr. Rhodes, and then followed by Mr. Roth. Uh, under the other announcements, I just wanted to mention that there's a, uh, a group of folks working on bringing more information about crowdfunding to the residents of Celine. Um, we met again last Friday, I believe it was, and we are currently looking at the possibility of having one of the businesses that has been successful in raising startup funds from uh, via crowdfunding to uh, present at a BBR uh, council building business relationships breakfast in October. And then secondarily working with uh, Michigan Municipal League and one of the other successful business startups to do an evening presentation in, in November, I think November 5th. Um, just, just to let more of our folks know about what can and can't be done through crowdfunding. Terrific, thank you. I appreciate your work on that um, work group that's convened by the chamber. I believe both you and business ambassador Korfman sit on that related to crowdfunding. So that's important work and we appreciate your efforts. Are there other announcements? Well, I actually have two. One, the first is pretty heavy, and then the second one is, is 
uh, well, much more appealing, for lack of a better way to articulate it. Um, I, I, the, the first is um, sort of a response to a, a most recent incident that occurred in the community relating to a gentleman who apparently was suffering from cardiac arrest um, and called a family member who promptly took him to the former Saline Hospital site, which of course is now an urgent care facility open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and subsequently the individual who was suffering from cardiac arrest expired. Um, and I think I speak for everyone on council when I say that our, our, our sympathies um, and our thoughts and prayers are extended to the entire family and all the loved ones of, uh, of the recently deceased. Um, the purpose for bringing this up is to just communicate and articulate one more time that we no longer have a hospital. We no longer have a 24-hour emergency room in this community. It has been replaced with a 12-hour uh, urgent care facility, again, operational from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., essentially in the same location that the former emergency room existed. I did have a conversation with um, uh, a member of the leadership team, in fact, the Director of Operations for St. Joe Hospital, which is a, a, a subsidiary, of course, of Trinity Health, um, and some of her colleagues and I, and um, I believe some folks from HVA and from the Saline uh, Police Department, and hopefully the Saline Area Fire Department will be meeting um, in the near future. Um, they're gonna be actually organizing the meeting um, to talk about ways in which we can more successfully disseminate this information. And the information, again, is that, you know, we don't have a 24-hour emergency room, it's urgent care, um, but of equal importance, I think it needs to be stated that when somebody is suffering from, or when someone is suffering a medical emergency, um, the, the industry standard and the professional experts say it is best to call 911 and deal with a paramedic. Um, so again, very regrettable, um, well, very tragic event that, that took place here recently. And again, we're gonna try our best to make sure that everybody in the community knows what, what services are available to them and what, what is the best uh, protocol and best response when, when either you or a loved one is suffering from a medical emergency. And evidently, there'll also be an article relating to this in the upcoming uh, FYI newsletter. So I just wanted to make you all aware of that. And subsequent to our, our meeting, I'll be sure to communicate the results. The second, as I said, is much more lighthearted, and that is I had the opportunity and the pleasure to attend an event this Saturday at Saline High School. It was put on by the Foundation for Saline Area Schools, and it was the um, inaugural um, um, launch of, of a new program that's going to induct people annually into the Saline Area Schools Hall of Fame. And there were eight um, terrific individuals who've done a lot for our schools, a lot for our community, who were inducted um, on Saturday. Um, there's a beautiful wall with their pictures and, and a bio if you go to the high school. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I haven't checked the reporter, but I was on the post this morning and there's a very nice article that, that Tran did. Um, so I just wanna bring that to everyone's attention. And if you see some of those individuals out and about, be sure to thank them for all the work they do on behalf of our schools and our, and our community. It was a very, very nice, lovely evening and it was great to, to celebrate their achievements. Are there any other announcements? No? Then we move on to the town hall facilitator. I believe about a week ago, maybe two, I forwarded you an email that I received from Sue Osborne, the mayor of Fenton, who was listed as a reference for Mr. Lou Bender, who's the gentleman we're considering as a town hall facilitator. Um, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that her, uh, her assessment was glowing. Um, and I uh, just wanted to make sure that everyone received that. Um, and if there's consensus, we'll continue to communicate with Lou and try and formalize an agreement that would be subject to review and approval, uh, review and approval by this council in the very near future. So I welcome any comments that you have at this time. I agree it's uh, appropriate to move forward. Okay, okay. Anybody object to that? No? Okay, everyone's good with that? Okay. So Terry, you have direction? Okay, excellent. We'll work on that and bring it back uh, in the not too distant future. Um, if there's nothing further on the town hall facilitator item, we'll move on to downtown parking. I um, actually would be interested, uh, maybe do you wanna start this off? Um, if there's anything you've worked on related to downtown parking in the last two, three weeks? Um, well, forthcoming, we, didn't, we staff doesn't have it prepared for this meeting, but um, uh, my hope is, um, to the next meeting or the first meeting in October, I believe, um, staff will be coming back with some mock-ups, if you will, of the, the proposed sign changes that we've talked about uh, in the, based off the PowerPoint presentation. Um, uh, so that, that's forthcoming, but as far as the, um, um, 
the any changes to the enforcement. We haven't uh, done anything further from the last conversation when uh, Chief Rennick and I uh, conducted, hosted the uh, meeting of the downtown business and property owners. Okay. Mr. Rhodes, I believe you sent out an email some time ago related to some thoughts you had on this issue. Do you want to address those? Well, they were, they were just my thoughts, of course, and, and we're taken under advisement by, by city staff. But, but uh, one of the uh, difficulties that we seem to have is trying to get people to park in the more outlying parking lots. And so my suggestion at that point in time was to have um, shorter time period for permitted parking in the inner lots and an unlimited parking, 24-hour parking in the in the outer lots to try to encourage people to move out. Um, still would require some enforcement in order to be effective because if we just post signs that's and don't enforce it, it's not going to mean anything. But so I and I don't know where uh, city staff is in in considering those suggestions. Sure. Well, I mean, again. Essentially, this is a um, policy decision. Um, I mean, we're um, from the, the city council. I mean, we have currently we have uh, as we the restrictions that are currently um, on the books, as they say, um, for the three-hour parking. If if council wants to change that, um, we can change that and move forward and, and begin the enforcing that. Um, but uh, I believe if I the discussion, the discussion, if I correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Rhodes, was from the um, the downtown business and property owners meeting, that uh, monthly meeting that uh, Slee Main Street hosts, I believe. And correct. there were some comments about, um, uh, again, posting unlimited parking so people know, for instance, parking lot three by the water tower on Henry Street and the and parking lot five on McKay Street, is that it's 24-7 uh, parking. Um, that uh, there are no restrictions and that um, parking lot two, which would be behind Comerica and, and the Max as it's referred to, um, and then parking lot four, which would be behind Benito's and Mangiamo Breck and Grill and, and Benny's in there, um, that would be, um, the majority of that is currently restricted to the three, but that would be, those two lots would be 12 hours, is that correct? Right, that was that was one of the suggestions. One of the suggestions. Either, either eight or twelve hours. So. Yep, and then then the um, and then the enforcement time was actually proposed, I believe, at that meeting for from um, eight a.m. to eight p.m. Monday through Saturday, and um, uh, currently it is um, it's uh, six. I'm sorry. Eight to six. Eight to six. Eight a.m. to six p.m. Currently. Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday. Thank you. I'm personally not prepared, obviously, to make a decision um, regarding enforcement tonight, though I am eager to see what staff has to present related to improved signage. I was also of the understanding, and maybe this is a question more for, for Chief Rennick, that at that time, whether it be next week or in a couple weeks when we review the signage, that there was also going to be some effort made to identify whether we could um, sort of... Um, do new markings on the street and create some additional spaces. Is that also being analyzed and evaluated? Yes, that, that is actually, that's also part of the, the, the presentation uh, with the sign mock-ups would be okay. where we would put additional parking spaces as well. Okay, all right. So we'll look forward to that then at one of our upcoming meetings. Are there any additional thoughts from council on this? Mr. Roth? Yeah, I, I, I kind of have some a questioning. At the present time, it doesn't appear that anything is being enforced as far as posted or ordinance or whatever it is. I, and I'm not sure where this edict came from as far as being policy decision made from the city council because I don't recall it being on my watch. I know when I was, the fall before I took office, there was some discussion on it about possibly hiring somebody to do such, but I don't recall of any particular council action as far as a, a, some agenda item really approved. So I, I really kind of perplexed on if we have something posted and so on, why it hasn't been done. And my question then leads to, we can put new signs up. We can do everything like we like to do, but how are we going to enforce these? Who's going to do such? Are we going to be in the same dilemma and being said that the council 
come up, didn't come up with far as make a policy decision how we're going to do such. I think that needs to be part of the package too. Well, I, I can address some of your questions, um, and maybe Mr. Gearbach can, can help me out here because, of course, he had a, a tenure on council um, Hail guy. many years ago. You're, I think, our most senior member of council in terms of, of number of years served. Um, but the, um, the signage that currently exists in the various parking lots enumerating the amount of time in which an individual is allowed to park in, in said parking lot um, pre, predates my tenure as a member of council, um, which began in January of 2009. My understanding is that those signs have been posted for a number of years. Yeah, I mean, they've been up since those lots were designed back in the late 90s. Um, but we did at that time, we had bicycle patrol and we had other officers enforcing those. But it was probably 10, 12 years ago that it basically became a, not that I supported it, but it just was not being enforced. Right. Priorities just went over and we didn't have the officers to support that right. type of thing. So essentially, and I think we, are, we personally are in agreement, Councilmember Roth, that we have policies on the books and rules that are posted, but for the last 10 years, probably 10 years plus, we have, we have chosen as a legislative body and as a city not to enforce. And so I think we're actually moving in the, the direction in the, the not too distant future of not just having a policy, but also enforcing it because I'm of the opinion, and I think this is shared by you, if you have a policy and you're not going to enforce it, there's not a whole lot of merit in having a policy. To your second question about if we as a legislative body take the appropriate steps and determine that it's appropriate to begin enforce, enforcement, that would be done by the police department. And I don't know if, if staff would care to comment or elaborate further, uh, but that would be done by the officers during their various shifts. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Well, this will come back unless there are additional comments. No? Okay. Well, then last um, but certainly not least is the request to partner with other communities for a targeted analysis. Ms. Korfman, do you want to come up with, with our guests this evening? I should note that um, in working with staff to prepare this agenda, um, it was originally um, going to appear as an action item, but I thought because of the um, well, because this was a new issue um, and something that is profoundly different than, than initiatives we've undertook in the past, it was appropriate to put it on as a discussion item. There'll be a brief presentation. You have some memor you have a mem memorandum, excuse me, that was delivered in your packet on Thursday. We'll open it up for questions, and then if there's consensus to move forward, we'll bring this back at a subsequent meeting for the appropriate action. So, Ms. Korfman, the floor is yours. Okay. The City of Saline has been invited to consider partnering with the City of Ipsy the city of Chelsea and the village of Dexter in conducting a target market analysis study for each of the four communities. The market study would be in cooperation with the Michigan State Housing Development Authority to seek a request for proposals to conduct a market study that incorporates the target market analysis, the TMA, methodologies for use in underwriting, planning, and development activities. As part of the TMA, each partner will receive a report with results for their community that highlight future housing needs and types of housing that has reached saturation. The total preliminary, preliminary cost of the TMA is 30000 to maybe 35000 If it's at 35000 then the City of Saline would fund 8000 of that project. The actual cost could <coughs> vary depending on the scope of the work. We briefly touched on housing in the market study that was done last year, and it mentioned a possible need for more unique housing choices and trendy options for downtown living. The TMA would dive into deeper data to address this topic in depth. Um, a selection from this report says, the best pros prospects for downtown housing might be directed toward the development of units that are quite different from the current inventory of housing options available in the broader community, including styles that might take advantage of the unordinary dimensions, layouts, and materials found in the upper levels of downtown commercial buildings to create distinguishable and even funky living and or live slash workspaces and for a higher density mixed use development at potential development sites in the downtown district and immediate surrounding area. So if you go to the market study that we did, it's right here under the housing opportunities. Um, I have Sharon Woods here tonight from the Land Use USA. She's here to answer any questions you might have about the value-added benefits of a TMA, 
how it's different from traditional studies, the possible scope of work, and any other questions you might have. Very good. Let's start out. Are there any questions for Ms. Korfman? No? Okay. Well, then the floor is yours, and I, we appreciate you being with us Thank and bearing, uh, bearing our, uh, our regular meeting until, uh, no, until the, uh, the wee hours here. No, I love it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Sharon Woods. I am a consultant. I'm a principal of Land Use USA, so I'm a small consulting firm, and I'm pre-approved by MISHTA to develop target market analyses and housing studies under their matching grant program. So MISHTA has a program where they will match 50-50 um, in terms of what the communities contribute. So the idea is that what was originally initiated really by um, the village of Dexter, and Michelle um, and Neil, if I'm saying her name correctly, she was very interested in doing a TMA. Um, MISHTA very much promotes and, and encourages communities to think about collaborating with other communities and their counties to share the cost. So the village of Dexter went to um, the county first, and then together with the county, they reached out to Ipsy, they reached out to Chelsea, and then those communities came together, had a meeting, um, and you also came, I believe, to that meeting. And then there was a question, you know, would, would Celine be interested in, in participating in this study? We don't have the city of Ann Arbor at the table, and, and we're not expecting to have them at the table. But we believe that if these communities do collaborate collectively together, that Mishta will then step up and say, yes, we're satisfied that this is a regional collaborative effort and we're willing to um, you know, review your application and hopefully contribute a 50% matching grant to the study. So collectively, you would share half the cost. Um, so that was one piece of it. So if you want to ask me more questions about cost, I'd be happy to do that. I'm also happy um, to talk about how a target market analysis is different from traditional housing studies. But my sense in, you know, I went through and read the downtown market study, there's, there's really maybe a page and a half that talks about housing at a very high level. And just briefly to explain that under the MISHTA's program, the ob objectives are as follows. First, they're very interested in understanding what are the opportunities for downtown housing choices. And this is all part of their initiative for placemaking under Governor um, Snyder's initiatives and under um, the My Place initiatives. So they're very interested in understanding what communities of all sizes um, need to do in order to compete, you know, regionally and, and nationally for population segments that are on the move. So the real challenge is that we have millennials, young professionals who are on the move. They're migrating, they're renters, and, um, and they're looking for jobs, and they're looking very much for places to live. So the challenge is how, how do we address not only place in our downtowns, but how do we attack this challenge of would they, would they live in our communities if we're not giving them the housing choices that they want? And they're looking for hip, trendy, cool places. They're look, apartments are unfortunately kind of an old-fashioned model, and they're looking for lofts and flats and um, townhouses perhaps or row houses or, or other cool places like you know, flats and lofts above street front retail. So the, the study is very much focused on the downtown and focused at understanding the lifestyle attributes of these moving millennials and what do they want and how does that apply to form and function in the built environment. And I'll just stop there because I, your time is important, but I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Very good. Well, that was an excellent analysis. We appreciate that. Let's start with questions. Uh, Council Member Rhodes. Um, I had several questions. One, you mentioned the uh, MISHTA would have this 50-50 grant. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that this study is $70,000? Or are we going to get half of our 8000 or 9000 back if we participate? Right, right, now they're, right now, the studies are costing about 30 and MISHTA is matching, on, on average, about 15 And I've done some studies for 20 where MISHTA has matched 10 has brought in 10 And I've done some other studies that... Um, you know, Mishta will, you know, they have certain mm -hmm. levels, but so, so, if so we the decide total to cost, the total cost, thirty to thirty-five, and you would contribute half of that 
collectively, your four communities collectively would contribute half. Okay, so we're really not talking about the eight or nine thousand dollars a piece then. That's correct. Something less. That's and, correct. And then are there some downstream benefits of participating with MISHTA on this? There are, and they're very, um, they're quite, um, they're quite laid out fairly carefully in MISHTA's minds. Um, they actually are keeping track of which communities and counties are completing a TMA, and down the pipeline, any developer who has a downtown project, whether it's a new build or a renovation of an existing historic building, if they go to Mishta and say, I would like to have some additional funds or support or grant money or contribution to help fund my project, Mishta's first question will always be, have you completed a TMA? Has, the, has your community completed a TMA? And if the answer is no, that developer's project is going to move to the bottom of the list. Okay. And hopefully the answer is yes. It's important so information it, it to have. It moves you up on the list in terms of being a candidate for, when I say you, I'm, I'm really speaking to your private sector developers who want to invest, invest in the heart of your downtown. They get to move up in terms of being candidates for Mishta money. And how long do you anticipate it would be before the results of this study are available to us? Once we commence the work, we're, we're at a three to four month timeline of completing the study. And that's typical for any kind of market study is usually a three month timeline. And are you evaluating the entire community of Saline or just the downtown area? It's, it's actually several levels. We would, we would first do a study of the entire county. Then we would carve it into um, the different communities and do citywide and village-wide studies. And then we would also carve out a sub-area, which would be just your downtown district. And we can delineate that. We would delineate that based on, on guidance from you. So it could align with your, D, you know, if you have a, the Main Street district or if you have... Um, you you know, have a Celine Main have, Street organization. Celine Main yeah. Street's, you know, study boundaries. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Roth. I, in a memo that we have from Kathy Kaufman at the last sentence in the first paragraph says total primary cost. Those words indicate there may be secondary cost. Can you address what the secondary cost may be or is that the cost? When I heard her say that, I, I had the same thought. There are no secondary costs. The cost is a non to, not to exceed um, lump sum budget of that amount and we I don't believe in work change orders and I, I don't believe it's not This isn't phase one of a two-phase project. So you can strike that word. Okay, Sharon in your just Last explanation you said you would first of all do the entire county then you do the cities then you do the breakout within the cities Why are we paying these four three or four entities paying for the county part of that study? Um, there are a lot of data sources that I rely on in order to understand the Celine story, and many of those data sources are unfortunately only available at a county level. So if that's one reason, is that th there's a building block. I, I often describe it as layers of a cake. In order for me to build the top layer of the cake, I have to build the foundation. And the foundation is I have to study, I have to understand what the entire county looks like before I start drilling in deeper and, and drilling into sub areas within the county. So even if you were to come to me and say, we want a TMA just for Celine and we don't want to pay for um, the county, I would still have to say, I cannot build the analysis for Celine unless I build the analysis for the county first. With your market study, I'm looking for as a payback. We as the city, you're asking us to finance a study that I look at far as really should be a developer financing such. We're hedging our bet that it's going to bring us in more tax money for us. Mm -hmm. But we're spending tax money now, and we spent a lot of tax money to develop our downtown. We have our Main Street program. We have different things, different ideas. I'm not sure where our payback is going to be for we taxpayers is paying this bill all along. Mm -hmm. How and where is this going to come back to us? We might get on a different level with the funding, potential funding things, which is going to go back to it. 
I look at this as something that the property owners, the people actually have the money there. They should be the one doing the marketing study so they can develop their property. Not so much for us as taxpayers paying the bill for the property owners downtown. Mm -hmm. and I, so I mean, it's a different kind of philosophy. I think we've oversaturated spending money on our downtown. Mm -hmm. Um, would you like me to respond? Please. So, and I understand your concern, and I respect your concern. Um, I do develop down, um, market studies for private sector developers as well. Probably a third of my clients are, are developers. When I do a study for them, it's usually site-specific. They've got a very specific site in mind, and they want me to really hone in on that, that one site, and that's how I do the analysis. If I were to do a TMA for these communities collaborating and, and one for Celine, it would be a study for your entire downtown district. And then the individual developers would, you know, we would work to qualify the recommendations for specific projects. So there is a little bit of a difference on methodology, but in terms of paying it forward, really part of the objective is to engage the community in the process and have you know, an, an open forum where maybe they could come in and learn about the TMA and how it benefits them, help them understand that once they have a TMA in place, that they can then go to MISHTA and use that as a resource and say, you know, and demonstrate to MISHTA, my project, my specific property aligns with the TMA and that will ease the process for getting funds to them um, from MISHTA and hopefully that returns as an investment into your community. The other investment is that we're trying to educate, we're trying to use the TMA as a tool and an educational resource to teach local developers the benefits of thinking about investing in their downtown districts. We have developers who are, you know, we believe are kind of stuck in this rut of building more of what they already know, what they what they see as successful comparables in the, in the market or have worked in the past. And unfortunately, that model um, kind of broke. When we went into the deep recession, that mo model got broken along with the slump in the housing market. We're trying to re-educate them about how they, you know, to rethink about their downtowns and think about mixed use projects and think about um, developing formats that are that that maybe they wouldn't they wouldn't get there on their own and that's our concern is and that's what i think the state of michigan's concern is that if we don't give them these resources and help bring them along and get their buy into the to that objective that they're just going to be out in the suburbs building more single family detached houses on cul-de-sacs so um i, I I understand your concern, but that is that is the objective and the initiative that comes through the Sense of Place Council. Are there any additional questions, Mayor Pro Tempt-Har? Yes. Um, could you, following up on on some of what you mm -hmm. just said, could you give us some examples of studies you've completed and how communities have used them? Well, in the state of Michigan, this is a fairly new program. It started in 2013. So, so far we have completed target market analyses for downtown Jackson. Um, also, let's see, no, all of Nuego County, a 10 county region that includes Grand Traverse County and all counties surrounding. Um, we're also working um, with the city of Onaway and we're actually doing a TMA for Washtenaw County right now for two specific sites that are along the Washtenaw Avenue corridor, the Reimagine Washtenaw Initiative. And I recently completed a TMA for a developer in, in Wyandotte. And again, um, these studies are being used to, to um, first of all, as an educational resource for the developers to get buy-in from the community and the stakeholders in terms of understanding what the objectives are and, and thinking about place and thinking about their downtowns and how important their downtowns are to their economic future. But also to take that study and then approach MISHTA and actually get additional support and, and funding from MISHTA. So there, there is a process there and that process is still underway. Thank you. Additional questions, Mr. Rhodes. Has there been any dialogue about microhousing in an attempt to get more people in our downtown and to keep get the price down to where more people can afford it? 
Very much so, and that's something that's a trend that I'm tracking as part of my, you know, one of my objectives is to talk about what are the unique formats of housing that are not in our communities today. What are we missing, and what are what do these millennials and different lifestyle clusters, what are they really looking for? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, in fact, my Mishta client, Jim Tischler, talks about micro-housing all the time, and he's, in fact, influenced me quite a bit on that topic. Are there any sites that have been approved in Michigan for housing? Not on microhousing yet, but I um, I have recommended a form of microhousing in some of the communities. So, but our what our millennials are looking for today are not you know they're they're willing to trade some space for technology. So you know building flats and lofts that are compact and designed well and and tech savvy. Um, and they can store their bike. <laughs> is is a you know they're willing to make that trade for, you know, living in a house out in the suburbs where they can't yeah, hang out of, with their friends. Yeah, the city of Seattle is working. Our city council is working through that process right now, mm -hmm. trying to establish minimum sizes, mm -hmm. maximum sizes, yep. locations of facilities within them, parking spaces, bike parking, and all that kind of thing. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. I've been kind of following that. I'm curious to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. And sharing of space as well. That we're, you know, we're seeing more and more young millennials designing, designing the inside of the of the units in such a way that you could have two separate bedrooms on different sides of the unit with completely private bathrooms that are sharing a living area and a kitchen. So, okay. thank you. Lots of solutions. Any additional questions, Mr. Roth? I was wondering, do you think Celine is a good candidate to recruit millennials? And if so, why should we recruit them? Or what do we have to offer them? You're talking about kind of a dream. Mm -hmm. I think we've got a lot of other things we need to work through first. Sure, uh, sure. Because I, I don't see millennials coming here because of many other factors. Also, I can see why contractors and people would want to build out in the townships because the tax rate is much lower than the paid with city taxes. Mm -hmm. Sure, I understand. Well, I, you know, there are many small communities of Celine size that understands how important their aging population is and the fact that the, you know, our older populations are living longer and they're growing in terms of you know, their, their voting power and they're active later in life and working later in life and they're, you know, they're core to our communities as well. But um, if we keep, you know, we're concerned that we're, we're losing our young populations in these communities as well. And it's the young, you know, we want to keep that young talent to keep us propelling forward. In terms of what Celine offers, I mean, I. Celine, first of all, you've got a great downtown, but we're finding that these, you know, millennials don't necessarily want to live in a big city, and by big city, I would say even like Ann Arbor or up, you know, midtown Detroit, but where they want to live is a cool place with quality of life. And I do believe that Celine offers quality of life. And I, I do believe that you could be missing some opportunities by not offering amenities that reach across a full spectrum of demographics and age groups. Mr. Campbell, did you have a comment? And then Mr. Gearbaugh, did you have a question, sir? I just want to make a comment. I was just going to say from the perspective of um, millennials aren't the only ones. The older adults want that type of living, too. So they I do. think and understand that there's a change in the whole shift of what type of housing demands are out there. So. And if you don't mind me elaborating, we, we do focus quite a bit on the millennials. They are a bigger group, although the aging populations are growing and as, as a size of a total group. Um, we, we talk a lot about the millennials because they have much higher movership rates. So our, our aging populations, where we also have interests in helping them age in place, in other words, continue living as long as possible in their single family detached owner occupied house. Whereas the millennials, um, and you know, there is some interest in having them live downtown as well, but the millennials, as a as a as a group, um, are a much larger group, so they get talked about more. Go ahead. And, and us gener generation Xers gotta take the table scraps, but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. And I get the scraps. Too. That's right. But uh, question I had, Sharon, was. Um, you referenced the downtown specific, and I understand that. And one of the questions I've had um, going into this is, um, 
we have the city owns two parcels that um, they're, we're currently marketing um, for uh, one is certainly residential one is the, the interest we've seen thus far is for residential as well would those be included in this yes I ask every community if they have specific sites in their downtown that they want us to qualify the recommendations for that we would do that so well, um, well these are these are one is about less than a half mile off of mm -hmm. from from the downtown and one's shy of a mile but it's it's between a half mile and a mile away from the downtown mm -hmm. um, so would that would those be could we include those absolutely okay. I mean you can you could tell me what you think your study area should be okay. the reason why we have a cost range a little bit in here is that you know we're, we're kind of forewarning the participating the partnering communities that you know the size of the study area and if if some of them want like three or four sub areas within the study area that those things start to build up the cost so we're, we're just asking when the communities collaborate that we're that we delineate a study area and try to you know keep it manageable just like how you might delineate a DDA district you have to think about can we do this to capture the area that we really think is critical without letting it without letting things swell how do we de portion. I'm sorry um, how do we determine if there's an increase in price by adding those two parcels um, you can in the RFP when you if, you know if there is an RFP release for consultants to bid on you could just lay out ask them to lay out the options okay so so I guess my question is and I guess this has been my question all along is so there may be additional costs but we don't know what those costs are going to be I've been at right because I haven't seen your RFP and when you write the RFP um, together with the other partner communities you would want to lay out what you think your study area would be and, and to give you an example I recently wrote a proposal for I forget whether it was Battle Creek or Kalamazoo or Grand Rapids it was one of those and they had 14 study sub areas so when we look at that that's when we start thinking you know okay we're not just doing one sub area we're actually doing this 14 different sub areas so that's where I I just um, that's why I was providing the price the total price in, in terms of a range 30 to 35 to just kind of give you at least a, a starting place that, that I think is realistic but until I know what you tell us your sub areas are I, I can't predict exactly what you would be good. Yes. thank you Mr. Gearbaugh in general, though, how many sub areas are you doing for the other little communities as part of this already? I believe that most of them have agreed to having one sub area each. Okay. Me uh, to basically delineate a downtown district. I know that Ipsy came back and said to, to help keep the cost down, we'll, we'll just ask you to do our downtown district in general. But if they come back and say, we've also got these three sites, can you tell us what you think about these three sites? I would say absolutely yes. Okay. So you would you would provide data about our entire community, but more specific, detailed data about whatever district we ask you to look at. Yes. Okay. Yep. It'll be the county, your city, your downtown sub area, and then I would qualify. It. I would write. I would write in the narrative report how that would be applied to each of a couple of sites that you might be of particular interest in. The district whatever you really want us to look closer. Well, let me, let me start this off because the goal this evening, of course, is to develop some sort of consensus as to whether or not this, this council, this legislative body, wants to move forward and partner with some of our neighbors. Sharon, I appreciate your time this evening and your analysis. Um, and uh, I'm certainly cognizant of some of the concerns that Council Member Roth articulated. Um, you know, I, I make a delineation between studies and analysis that, that you undertake that come with a financial cost and those that do not. Mm -hmm. And those that do not, it's sort of a no-brainer to me. Why wouldn't you just gather the data so you can make an informed decision? I think analysis that come with a cost require a little bit more scrutiny, scrutiny and uh, maybe a little bit more cynicism mm -hmm. or skepticism, excuse me. Um, but at the same time, I talk often and frequent about this body and about this city making data-driven decisions. And I think the information that you would gather would be um, particularly relevant and useful. Um, and I'm especially cognizant of the fact that 
if in the future we had a developer who came to Celine with a lot of interest and a lot of enthusiasm and was looking to develop a relationship with Mishta, I am very much aware of the fact that this is going to influence that particular developer's ability to leverage financial resources and support. Um, so that, that's very important. And um, I think having you provide an analysis on two lots that our city manager referenced that we have for sale, one on Maple and one very close to our downtown on Monroe Street, would be, um, would be greatly beneficial as well. So I am in favor of moving forward um, and working with staff to, to create the appropriate motion at a subsequent meeting to formalize this relationship. I'd be interested in hearing what my colleagues have to say. Mr. Rhodes? Um, I, I also agree. I you know we, we need sometimes to spend some money up front in order to make our community more attractive to developers and other business owners to come in and, and generate a more lively community and, and more tax for us. So I, I would support moving forward with this. Okay, Mr. Gearball? Well, considering that there's potential cost sharing on this from the state, which would have the cost, I agree. I think part of the thing is that we've got to be able to come to the table when something makes itself present. And if we don't have the pieces and we fall behind in the list, that's the reason why we don't get the um, opportunity grants like other communities do. And I think for this situation, um, it isn't just looking at one parcel, but it would be the whole of downtown. So there's many opportunities downtown that I think this would benefit to. And this isn't a significant $50,000 study. It's one that potentially that's what we should be using some of our TIFA funds for. And I think there's form, there's funds available for this type of project. Mr. Roth? Well, I, you heard kind of my concerns about downtown. And I think this is another downtown thing that we're spending lots of money at. Well, looking at page seven and eight, as far as what the summary is going to be for us to report projected for it, I see a lot of this information I think the Main Street should provide for us. So I kind of question on it. I'm problem with far as I'd like to cooperate with our other cities that would like to have us come in as a partner. I look at it because I was wondering, you're there representing a business and a livelihood and you want to take business. What are your competitors doing? Is there a cheaper way for us to go about such? Shall we partner or not partner? I think we need to spend more time studying and thinking about this instead of jumping on the bad and wagon. And I kind of wonder, when is it going to stop we pouring money in downtown? I live in the city. I'm paying these taxes. So many of my residents in the city is paying the taxes. And it's such a discrepancy, the amount of taxes we pay as city residents versus what the township has. And it's cut, it, these things here all add to it. So it's adding up that it's getting awfully costly to live in the city of Sydney itself. So the attractive millenniums and that type of stuff, we need to reconsider, get our heads on right for us. Think about how much money and when do we stop pouring money in downtown. Okay, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Tahar. Um, I'm in favor of moving forward and looking at this. Um, I think the opportunity to partner with uh, other cities in the county um, and the cost share uh, make it attractive. One of my questions was going to be if there's some sort of economic development funds that we might use to fund this. Um, Mr. Gierbach has already um, alluded to that. So um, that would be I, 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 something in, um, favor of this and the the um, as I was reading over the materials before the meeting and and thinking about this um, the thing that struck me about um, such an analysis that I think we we talk around this and um, we don't have the the expertise to um, to think about different forms of housing and different ways of placemaking we you know we all live in classic standard and maybe not the most attractive to millennials or perhaps also the aging population kinds of homes. So I think the, the, the opportunity from, from this analysis to get a perspective that none of us has and that would be another useful tool for the development of the city is, is what's really attractive to me. Very good. Thank you, ma'am. Last but certainly not least, Councilwoman. You Simon know, King. when you are last in line, it is difficult to come up with brand new things to say. <laughs> so I, I do concur. I am in, in favor of this, and and I just I want to address Councilmember Roth in in the idea of spending so much money on the downtown without our downtown core being vibrant. Um, Celine's a pass through, 
And I think that's what we've all sort of come to realize is how important it is. And, and I will continue to support the downtown very significantly. Um, and I do, I, you know, parts of this that I'm really in favor of are the collaboration with other communities who face similar issues um, that we have. So. So I think we have consensus. I, I just want to add, um, because the point's been made by, by several of my colleagues about the downtown, and, and clearly this has a downtown focus, but it, it's certainly greater than that. It includes a focus on the entire community and ultimately on the county. And I do believe, to your point, Sharon, that that data will also be useful to us here on, on City Council as well. So um, I think this is a good initiative. And Ms. Corpin, do you feel like you have the appropriate consensus now to, uh, to work with staff to, to draft a motion and then come back at one of our subsequent meetings? Thank you. Any additional questions or thoughts? Ladies, thank you very much. Sharon, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. I'm available if you have any questions. Very good. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, that, uh, that concludes the discussion portion of our agenda. We move on now to public comments. Uh, under the Open Meetings Act, any citizen may come forward at this time and make comment or question to City Council. This public comment period will be limited to three minutes per person. Anyone who would like to speak is requested, but not required to state his or her name and address for the record. Are there any citizen comments? There are no citizen comments. Is there any other business to come before Saline City Council this evening? Our next meeting is next Monday on the 15th at 7.30, and that's followed by our first meeting October on October 6th with a work meeting beginning at 6.30 with our Labor Council, Mr. Steve Gerard, to discuss non-union employment agreements. And that will be followed by a regular meeting at 7.30. We've already excused the absence of Council Member Burgoyne, so at this time I would seek a motion to adjourn this regular Council meeting at 9.00. Let's say 9, 18 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Gearbaugh. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Councilwoman Saibo Keeney. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Ayes have it.